today we're going to be dealing with characterizations and contexts, something particularly important to your case construction. Firstly, what is the difference between a characterization and a contextualization? Now, how I like to think of this is a characterization is the story that you tell within the debate. So you are creating an argument to tell us about the characterization. And that effectively forms a foundation for the rest of your arguments that happen within your case. Contextualization is about using real world analysis or real world examples to give weight to your story. So to tell us that your story is likely to be true based on what has happened in the world today. It's really important to think of context and characterization as part of the debate and therefore as part of what you need to use to be persuasive. So you need to win the context and characterization throughout the debate. Expect that your opposition will challenge you on your context and characterization. The important thing to note is that you should create that context and characterization after you have created your case or your argument. Because this is the place where you tell stories about the world you think you live in. And if the story doesn't match the arguments that you're trying to prove. It won't have as much persuasive effect as if you create your arguments and then find the context that tells the story that is most apt for the arguments that you are creating. So expect that people will challenge your context, expect to construct it argumentatively, and expect to progress it throughout the debate and evolve it. So how do we create a context? And there's four elements I want to talk about in this video. The first is trends, the second is tipping points, the third is historical parallels, and the fourth is principle. So how do you use those four elements? And here, you want to effectively create a timeline. So the status quo is the now, that's where the tipping point will operate. The trend predicts the future, and the historical parallels look into the past to better aid you in predicting the future. Then finally, the underlying principle is kind of the thread that ties those three different things together. And that's particularly important. Okay, so how are we going to use this? Firstly, we identify things that are happening in the status quo. So when you are outlining a problem that exists within the status quo or the scenario and the story and the picture that you want to create within the status quo, then you have outlined that and then you try and identify a tipping point. A tipping point won't always exist in every scenario, but if you can find a tipping point, it's very valuable to the debate. So you outline the status quo and you show us if there is a tipping point that is a game changer to the debate. Then you tell us what the trend is. So not only is something bad now, but it's also likely to be bad in the future. Or it's also likely to get worse. Um, if you are on the other side, you might say that it's likely to get better. So the trend and what is going to happen in the future is also very important. Here's where you use historical parallels, because you say that something similar has happened in the past, and therefore it gives more credibility to what you think will happen in the future. So that's how you link up what exists in the now to what has happened and what will happen, and give weight to that context. Because now you have a timeline of a story as opposed to a point along a line. What connects this timeline then is the actual principles analysis. And this is something to note because when people start using context, they talk about how bad things are and they create a lot of urgency which is valuable, but then they go directly into their argumentation. And so it seems like their arguments only work in the most extreme circumstance, which is not necessarily the case. Pulling out the principle of the thing means that you can object to the principle underlying the context and therefore that can be common in all circumstances, regardless of how urgent or how extreme the context is. In terms of context, you would generally put characterizations and contextualizations at the very beginning of your speeches if it is common to all the arguments you're going to talk about. In the case where it is specific to a single argument, you would then put it into your argumentation individually as opposed to at the front of the case. So I'm going to do a motion now, this house would legalize all recreational drugs. And here we could talk about the status quo being a problem in terms of individuals being harmed by us banning recreational drugs, why they can opt into recreational drugs and how it better protects them from the harms that currently exist because of criminality as opposed to the substances themselves. Then we could talk about a historical parallel in terms of saying how alcohol prohibition did not work how people were actually engaging in more dangerous types of alcohol abuse and how crime was associated with that. So at the point at which you criminalize something 
that shouldn't be criminalized and that people are still going to opt into, it makes it much easier for people to engage in other criminal elements. So, for example, in the US, during the time of Prohibition, there was a massive rise in the murder rates. In the same way, because drugs are banned now, there's a lot of drug cartels who engage in criminality and are able to have a massive pull on our society and a massive amount of power within our society. Banning drugs specifically fuels the kind of criminality that is particularly harmful to our society. And the historical parallel there would be alcohol prohibition. You can also look at the drug war potentially and how that's actually caused more harms to individuals than it has benefits, how it's been incredibly expensive as a foreign policy and it's been incredibly damaging. You could look at Portugal and their policy of decriminalizing drugs and how that's actually created a safer environment for their citizens and has had positive effects in terms of both addiction, in terms of criminality, and in terms of society in general. Then you could finally look at the trend where many different countries have chosen to start liberalizing their drug policy. And finally, to connect all of those timelines together, you could say that the legal market allows for people to better protect themselves and to take drugs in a safe way. The next topic that I want to talk about is spectrums. What we need to recognize here is that real life is complicated. There isn't one answer or one story that people have to tell. Not everybody that is part of a single group thinks exactly the same way. And so when you tell a very simplified story, you run the risk of not being genuine to the context. You've got to remember that these are real people and their lives and their lived experiences that you're talking about. You have to give that some respect and you have to try and construct those stories meaningfully. Part of how you can do that is with spectrums. The mistake that people often make is to only speak about stories that suit them, not stories that are genuine to the context. This doesn't mean that you have to talk about every single example with equal amounts of importance, including all the stuff that would be bad for your case, but it does mean that if you include a spectrum, you can talk about both examples that are very good for your case and examples that are bad, but draw in an underlying principle that will mean your argumentation stands in either scenario, as opposed to being open to people challenging the original story that you're giving. So how do you construct a spectrum? Well, first you look at your best case, and then you look at your worst case, and those will form the extremes of a spectrum. Then, when you're looking at those two scenarios, you have to look at what they have in common. And this is the common thread in principle. That's what you're going to try and talk about within your argumentation. That's what your argumentation should be based on. In constructing that, you don't have a circumstance where your arguments only work in the extreme cases. So for example, if you have a debate about negotiating with terrorists, characterizing all terrorists as completely irrational, violent, and unwilling to negotiate is probably untrue and means that the debate cannot happen. So if you were going to negotiate with terrorists, there would have to at least be some terrorists who would be willing to negotiate in some ways. And so giving a better picture of the fact that they might be willing to negotiate, but that you would have to give up more than you are willing to give up. So territory, power, wealth, whatever the case may be. That means that you probably, even if people are willing to negotiate, the outcomes would be moot because you're not willing to give terrorists what they want. So that is a far better picture than simply saying, oh, they're irrational and they will never come to the negotiating table. I'm going to do the example, this house regrets the rise of the aggressive left. The least extreme things that the aggressive left does is probably their prominence and activism on social media, challenging people in terms of their bigotry, in terms of their assumptions about individuals within disenfranchised groups. The most extreme ends of the spectrum probably include intimidation tactics and even physical violence. Note that you don't have to support the entirety of the spectrum. You can support the majority of the spectrum or regret the majority of the spectrum. So in a circumstance where you are required to defend the aggressive left, you might not defend physical violence in the name of the aggressive left. The principle that connects the extremes of the spectrum is the idea that you should disrupt and dismantle systems of power and that the disenfranchised anger is legitimate. So that's how you would construct a spectrum for that motion. And so you see there, once you've drawn out the core principle and you've identified the extremes of the spectrum, you've already made yourself robust to any contextual challenges you get from your opposition. So ideally you want to use your characterizations to tell the story, use your contextualizations to make that story seem real, and lastly create spectrums within your characterizations, your contextualizations, and your arguments themselves to show that in all cases your arguments hold true. Thanks.